favorite hymns, I guess, at, at each time I mention a favorite one. But I do love the hymns. I, 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 love, I love the old songs. There's good new songs as well. I, I like the choruses. Uh, there, there's some good choruses, uh, I think, as well, too, uh, that, that are, you know, correct with the Scripture, with the Bible and everything. And uh, But I tell you what, just, just the old hymns, I, I have an old Baptist hymn book. It's, it's, it's really hard to beat. And, uh, and I appreciate uh, the singing of the hymns. I appreciate uh, Brother Tim uh, leading us and Sister Renee uh, on the piano. They're uh, just a great blessing. And, uh, and it's a blessing to be in the Lord's house. Let me just say a word of welcome to anyone that will catch our videos online. We appreciate you uh, keeping up with us online. We just hit the, uh, got a message saying that we've had 11,000, that was this morning, uh, 11,000 views of our videos on uh, on the YouTube and uh, and we've got we put them on a fa Facebook page as well and you can find that if you just look up uh, Grace Baptist Church of Hansville Alabama you, you'll, you'll be able to find it and uh, those of you that, that uh, using the computer and in fact if you're hearing me speak right now I know you can do that because you're already you're already on it right now but, uh, but anyway, we're glad that you're. If you haven't done this though, if you've not if you've not subscribed to the YouTube channel, uh, we'd like for you to click that button there and subscribe. And then also, if you click that thumbs up or that like button uh, on the YouTube, if you do the same on the on the, if you go to our Facebook page and do the same there and follow us there on Facebook. I don't know a lot about it, but I understand. That, that the more of those things that, that we'd have, the more subscribers on YouTube, the more followers on Facebook, the more times that you would like uh, the message and, and click on that, that it, that it does something to uh, uh, make our videos come up on people's uh, uh, home feed, uh, it maybe, uh, whatever it is that they call it, but it, it comes up in front of them. Uh, it'll come up on their computer or on their screen on the television, on the Roku channels and, and things like that. Uh, it'll come up in front of them more, uh, the more that we, we have 
uh, of you helping us to do that. And then the other thing that you can do is just spread the word, invite others to, to find us. And uh, if you have, a, for instance, a Facebook page, uh, you could share our videos on, on, your, on your page. And uh, that would help it just get out uh, as well. And then we would like to invite you to be with us if you're at any time, you're anywhere near uh, Hansville, Alabama, if you live near here in anywhere at all, Coleman County, Alabama, uh, we'd like for you to come be with us uh, in person uh, here at Grace Baptist Church. Sunday morning, we have Sunday school at 9.30 and our worship service is at 10.30. Come back together at five o'clock for our evening service. We're here Wednesday evenings at six o'clock and we'd love for you to be here with us for any or all of our services, and especially if you are in need of a, of a good home church. Uh, if you're uh, looking for a church to attend and you need a home church, uh, maybe you're new to the area and you've run across this, looking at things in the area in Coleman County, uh, then, then, then find us over here in Hansfield. We're not hard to find, and uh, right, just right in town, just down the road from the high school, and uh, so we're right in town and, and you can find us uh, at Grace Baptist Church. We'd like for you to be here at any of our service times. And so with that said, again, thank you for watching us. Let's go ahead and stand together, church. You have your text now ready in Isaiah chapter 49 as we have been continually going through uh, the book of Isaiah for over a year now. And uh, we're uh, going verse by verse studying this tremendous book, 66 chapters. And uh, so it's, it's, it's quite a long book to study, uh, the prophet Isaiah. But uh, just think of this, when, when we get it done, uh, you could say, man, I am dear through preaching verse by verse all the way through Isaiah. <laughs> you know, thank God for that. Well, we're in chapter 49. I'm going to pick up the reading today from verse 14 down through verse number uh, 16. A very brief text. But I think, I think there's a special message here. Uh, the Lord really laid on my heart a special message. It, it, it just jumped out. It was special to my heart. I want to deal with the question today, does, does God care for his people? Does God care for his people? Well, I believe you know the answer to that, but let's, let's look at it in the word of God. And so we're going to look at verse 14 down through verse 16. I'm going to go back to verse 13 as well, but I'll do that in, in, in a moment. Let's pick up the text, verse 14. But Zion said, The Lord hath forsaken me, and my Lord hath forgotten me. Can a woman forget her sucking child, that she should not have compassion on the son of her womb? Yea, they may forget, yet, yet will I not forget thee. Behold, I have graven thee upon the palms of my hands. Thy walls are continually before me. This is God speaking through his prophet Isaiah to his people Israel. The questions come up from them. Does God really care for his people? Let's pray together. Lord, we do thank you for the reading of the word of God this evening. We thank you for the opportunity that you give us once again to come back together uh, as a church family, uh, as, as your people, Lord, to study your word. Lord, we thank you for uh, our time throughout the prophet Isaiah. And Lord, we look forward to all that you have for us as we would continue with your help and by your spirit uh, to continue forward in our studies. And we come to this 49th chapter, Lord, and and, uh, and we're asking uh, today and this evening that you would speak to our hearts in a new and, and a fresh way. Lord, that you would show us wonderful things from thy word. And Lord, we know that you're well able to do so. We thank you for the presence of the Holy Ghost of God, the Holy Spirit, that illuminates the written word of God, our Bible, and speaks to our own hearts that we might uh, apply your word to our lives and live our lives in accordance to your word, that we might be pleasing to thee, and Lord, that you would choose to bless us. And Lord, we know that you will. You've told us that blessings will come in accordance to our obedience to the word of God and our, our understanding and our faith and our trust in your word. So Lord, we pray that you'll help us to follow your word tonight, uh, speak to our hearts, Lord, we pray for those that would hear the uh, messages online, that would follow the videos online. 
Lord, we pray for uh, pray for them, Lord, that they would just not be a be kind of passing through, looking at things, but Lord, that they would uh, that they would stay with it. They would hear the message all the way through, and would listen with an open heart, that the Spirit of God could speak to their heart and apply the Word of God to their heart, their spirit, and for those that are unsaved, Lord, we pray for them especially that they might be saved upon belief and faith in the gospel of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, calling upon his name and his name alone to be their Savior. And Lord, we pray for the saved. We pray for our brothers and sisters in Christ that may be struggling in their walk with the Lord now, that may be having some type of spiritual difficulties, that they've got some questions, they've got some doubts, they've been hit uh, with some troubles. And, and, and maybe there's someone that uh, catch this message and, and they're even wondering uh, whether, Lord, you really care for them or not. Lord, we just pray that the word of God would do what you would have it to do in the hearts and lives of people. And Lord, we'll thank you for all that you do. In Jesus' name, we humbly pray. Amen and amen. Thank you. you. May be seated. Thank you for standing for the Word of God uh, once again. I'll just remind you a little bit of what we've been uh, seeing here in chapter 49 because it is, I think, a special chapter. As we've said, it's all about Jesus. Uh, it's, it's all about Him. Uh, it, it's a prophetic view of the Messiah, uh, of His mission. We said that in verses 1 through 7 and then of His ministry. In verses 8 through 13. When we talk about his ministry as we studied on Wednesday night uh, together, uh, we're talking about what he came to the earth to do. And it, it, when you ask the question, what did Jesus come to do? Well, one, one of the things that comes to our, our thoughts immediately would be the verse that says that he came to seek and to say that which was lost. And that's what he did. He came to do that. And, and really, you could say that is a good statement that kind of sums up uh, what he came to do. But he came to bring us some things. He came to bring us a day of salvation in verse number 8 in, the cha in, the, in chapter 49 here. Thus said the Lord, in an acceptable time have I heard thee. In a day of salvation have I helped thee. He came to bring us a day of salvation. The Apostle Paul quotes from this and uses uh, this verse in Isaiah when he writes in 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse number 2, Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. And what he's doing when, when, when in the New Testament, what Paul is doing is trying to get across to his readers the urgency of getting saved while you got the chance. Amen. While you've got the opportunity, while you've got the time. And we're living in the last days. And, and we studied that here at Grace Baptist Church uh, much as we've gone through the book of Isaiah. We've studied through uh, the book of Daniel in our church. We've, we've studied verse by verse through the book of the Revelation uh, as well together. And we know we're living in the very last days. We, we know that the Lord Jesus Christ is returning. And he's going to come uh, first for his church, for those that are saved uh, by the grace of God. He's going to step out on cloud, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Uh, there's going to be the sound of a trumpet. There's going to be a shout. There's going to be a call. And, and, and we're going to be called up to be with him. Those that have died in the Lord have put their faith and trust in the Lord. Their, their soul and their spirit is with the Lord. Because the Bible says to be absent from the body is to be present from, with the Lord. And that's, that's, for the, that's for the Christian. That's for the child of God. Now the lost person... The one that has never trusted Jesus as his or her own Savior. Uh, the moment that they die, uh, they're, 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 they're not in the presence of the Lord. They're in the presence of the devil. They're in the presence. They're, they're in hell. You have Luke chapter 16. And that account of that rich man that died. And he opened, the Bible says he lifted up his eyes, opened his eyes, being uh, in, in hell, being in torments. And he knew where he was at. He knew the suffering that he was experiencing. He knew the pain. That place, the Bible says, of weeping and gnashing of teeth. Well, that, that's where all the souls of men that have rejected Jesus Christ as their Savior are in that place now. And those that have trusted Christ, they're with him. Even though their bodies may be in the grave, their soul and their spirits are, are, are with him. But yet the day is going to come when those bodies of, of the 
the saints of God, of those that have believed on Jesus as their Savior, and those Old Testament saints that believe the Word of God looking ahead to the coming of Jesus Christ and, being, uh, and paying the price for their sins with the blood that He shed on Calvary's cross, uh, there's going to be a resurrection of their bodies. And their souls and their spirits and their bodies will be reunited together. Uh, and they will be brought out of those graves. And they'll have a resurrected body. They will have a new body. And according to uh, the time of the what we call the rapture, and the, uh, those of us that may be alive on the earth at that time, because it can happen any moment now, there's nothing that precludes it. No other prophecy, nothing else that needs to happen according to the Bible. And that event will take place. And that's any day. It, it could happen this evening. It could happen tomorrow morning. It, it, it might not even happen for a year or two or 10 or 20 years. We don't, we don't, that's the thing. You don't know. Jesus said you don't know. Matthew 24 and 25, go back and, and, and read those chapters again. And he tells us in all these things, you don't know just the day or the hour exactly when it's going to happen. You just better be ready. That's the key thing. You've got to be ready. There's only one way to be ready, my friend, and that is to know that you have trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior. You've been born again. Uh, the Spirit of God indwells you. You, you know you're saved. And, 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 I, and I've always believed this. When I say to someone uh, and start talking about salvation and, uh, and what it means, that if you are really saved, then you understand it. But if you've got some questions or so forth, then, 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 then uh, you might not be in that good of a situation. And so you need to know. You need to know that you have eternal life. You need to know that you're born again. You need to know that if you die today, that your soul and spirit will be with the Lord Jesus Christ, that you'll be, uh, you'll be in the very presence of God in heaven. Your body will be in a grave somewhere waiting for his return to be reunited with your soul and your spirit. You'll have that new resurrected body and will live forever with him. But for those of us that could have the opportunity to be in these bodies, to be alive uh, at the time of his coming, when he steps out on that cloud, the way it's described there in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, we're going to be called up with the saints of God that's going to come out of the grave. We also, we also are going to, going to receive a resurrected body. We, don't, we, we, we won't go through the grave to do it, but 1 Corinthians chapter 15 says we're going to be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. And we're going to be caught up. We're going to be with them and meet the Lord in there, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. And, and, and so uh, there is coming a great day of salvation. And Paul, uh, not, not only the salvation of your soul, but the salvation of your body and the salvation from this earth and to have that privilege and that opportunity to live forever with the Lord. That day is coming. Uh, salvation is a, it, it, it is a big thing. It's a big thing. It's a wonderful thing. And so Paul, in using this uh, verse here out of Isaiah chapter 49, is saying, look, the hour is late. And it's an urgent thing. But he says, now's the time. Now's the accepted time. It's as if Paul, in writing in New Testament days, is saying that what Isaiah said in the Old Testament days, so many hundreds of years even before, Paul is letting his readers, letting his people know, say, hey, this is the time now that Isaiah is talking about. The urgency of it. You're going to get saved. This is the time to do it. And you need to before it's too late. You don't want to be left behind when Jesus comes. And you certainly don't want to die. You don't want to face death without having Jesus Christ as your Savior. And so there's that day of salvation. Uh, that's what he came to bring. He came to bring deliverance for the captives in verse 9 down through verse number 11. In the New Testament also, in Luke chapter 4, verse 18, Jesus said that he came to preach the gospel to the poor and to preach deliverance to the captives. That's us. We are, cap we, we are the captives of, uh, of sin. We, uh, without the Lord Jesus Christ, we're, uh, we're, we're subject to sin. We're in bondage to sin. And, and we need to be delivered from that. Well, he does deliver us from sin. And he does deliver us from the bondage of our sin. In John chapter 5, verse 24, he said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my words and believeth on him that hath sent me uh, hath 
uh, everlasting life. And listen, and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. No more condemnation, the Bible says. There's no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus, the Apostle Paul wrote. And so, you see, we, we, he delivers us even now from the bondage and from the penalty of our sin. One day he's going to deliver us from the very presence of sin and bring us to our eternal home. And so he came to bring deliverance for the captives. He came to bring a drawing in of the scattered in verse 12 and in verse number 13. There we see especially the application to the Jews. God was going to bring them back to their land. That was his promise. And you remember in Isaiah's prophecy and in these chapters that we've been studying here recently, that it very much is applying to, uh, in Isaiah's day, to the coming time of the Babylonian captivity. It's still going to be from Isaiah's time that he wrote this some 150 plus years or so, or, 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 or I'm sorry, some 100 uh, years before the captivity uh, uh, really starts. And then, and then uh, Isaiah has talked about, has told us about, the, given us the prophecy of when God's going to deliver his people out of that captivity. Going to raise, raise up Cyrus, the Persian, to bring them out of captivity and to bring them, to allow them to uh, go back into their land in, in, uh, in Jerusalem and in, in Judea. And, and so uh, he's going to do that. He, he, he's drawing the scattered in. And he's done that down through uh, the centuries of time, uh, up to modern time, 1948. And we've talked about it, how he brought the people uh, of Israel back into the land and the nation of Israel. And, and, and I believe with all my heart, it's there to stay now, no doubt about that. But I want you to notice something in verse number 13 before we get into our text and deal with this question, does God care for his people? In verse 13 again, where he says, Sing, O heavens, and be joyful, O earth, and break forth into singing, O mountains, for the Lord hath comforted his people and will have mercy upon his afflicted. That's a promise that God is giving through his prophet Isaiah to his people of Israel and of Judea, that though that they will have to go through that Babylonian captivity, God's going to bring them out. And he makes the promise here. He says, I'm going to do it. And I'm going to bring the scatter. And he's also making a promise looking ahead to the time after the raptures we've just talked about. And then that seven-year period of tribulation on the earth, which we have studied already before. Understand this, that doesn't come until after the rapture takes place. And that seven-year period of tribulation, it'll begin with a peace treaty between the Antichrist and, 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 and Israel and, and really uh, in many of the nations of the world, at least in that time. Now, not, not all the nations are going to get involved in it. You're going to have some of those northern nations. I don't believe Russia. Uh, it looks like Russia and China and some other places and, and Confederate with them. They won't be involved in that. But the Antichrist is going to make a treaty with Israel. Going to enable them to build that third temple. There's a lot talked about the building of the third temple now. Uh, they're getting things ready. They even they even got they they say now they even got the red heifers. They're ready to make the sacrifices, and and all this thing is coming into place. But understand this: none of that's going to happen until until the rapture takes place. You got to be ready for the coming of Jesus. You don't wait to see these things taking place. That the Bible says is going to be in that tribulation period. Now, whether that's real soon, real immediate after the rapture, whether that's few months or few years what there's going to be the time of that building of the temple there's going to be that uh that 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 uh that treating but daniel the prophet says that that's when that 70th week of daniel daniel chapter number nine that seven year period of tribulation it begins with the treaty begins with a peace treaty that the antichrist will make uh with with israel and so this is even looking ahead to beyond that it's looking to the time where in that time of tribulation, and at the end of that tribulation period, the end of that seven years, God's going to bring his people back into the land in Israel, scattered from the four corners of the earth. He's going to bring them back. He's going to bring them back, and he's going to have them there because he's got a day when Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is going to step out of heaven, and this time on a white horse, and armies of heaven are going to be following him. Read Revelation chapters 
19, 20, 21, 22. Right, read, 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 the, read, the, uh, read, read Revelation. He's coming back. And he's coming to defeat uh, the armies of the earth. And he's going to throw the devil into a bottomless pit for a thousand years. He's going to walk into the city of Jerusalem through that eastern gate. He's going to come over to Mount Olivet. He's going to cross over that Kidron Valley. He's going to be wearing a vesture dipped with blood because he's going to do some business with some of the nations that, that had come against Israel all through the years, down through, uh, uh, down, down through the time, uh, especially with the, with, the, with, with, the, with the Midianites. And, uh, and, and, he's going to, and he's going to come into the city of Jerusalem and he's going to set up his kingdom. He's going to build another, uh, another temple. Uh, he, he's not going to go into the temple of the Antichrist. I understand that. Uh, Antichrist is going to uh, do a blasphemous thing in that temple at the halfway mark of the tribulation period. No, there's going to be, there, there's going to be the, the millennial temple that Jesus is going to have. And he's going to set up his kingdom right here on the earth. I believe this is referring, Isaiah is referring to that as well. When he says, sing, O heavens, be joyful, O earth. Break forth into singing, O mountains, for the Lord hath comforted his people, and we'll have mercy upon his afflicted. It's all about the full deliverance that God is going to have for his people, not just out of Babylonian captivity, but deliverance even from the, from the world itself that has hated Israel and is hating Israel even more and more in this day you're living in now. God's going to bring them into the land. God's going to bring uh, the king to set up his kingdom on the earth. And so he's going to do all this. He's going to draw in the scattered. Now this is a song of praise here. Heaven and earth are breaking forth into singing. And this joy comes because of the victory, I believe, that the cross of Jesus Christ brings to all of God's people. Remember, everything in the Old Testament is looking ahead to Calvary and to the cross. Uh, they're saved the same way we're saved. They're saved by the blood of Jesus that was shed on the cross of Calvary. And we're saved because we have a merciful God. In Psalm 106 and verse number 1, Psalm 106 verse 1, Praise ye the Lord, O give thanks unto the Lord for his good, for his mercy endureth forever. Psalm 107 verse 1, O give thanks unto the Lord for he is good, for his mercy endureth forever. I tell you something that I found out, to be honest with you, just studying a little bit more uh, this afternoon. I found out that that statement there, for his mercy endureth forever. You find, it, you find that statement with those words exactly 35 times in 35 verses in the Old Testament, 29 times in the book of Psalms. For his mercy endureth forever. We serve a merciful God tonight, church. Amen. He's a merciful God. And he's given us of his spirit. Uh, in John chapter 14, uh, Jesus tells of the, of the coming of his, of his, of his spirit. Uh, John 14 and verse 25, uh, he says, uh, These things have I spoken unto you, being yet present with you, but the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. And he continues on, uh, even in, uh, in chapter number 15 of John, verse number 26. But when the Comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth, which proceedeth from the Father, he shall testify of me. And, uh, and so it, it, we serve a merciful God. He's given us of his Holy Spirit. That lives within us. Those of us who are who who know the Lord Jesus Christ by faith that we've been saved and born again, and that Holy Spirit of God that resides within us, He brings us into all truth, and He's our teacher, and He's our guide, and, and He's the one that can illuminate the Word of God and apply it to our hearts and our lives that we might serve the Lord. But He does all of that because of His mercy. He's He's our merciful God as well as the merciful God of Israel. But in verse 14, you, you see all of this, what God would do for his people, bring a day of salvation, deliverance of the captives, and, and drawing in the scattered. He, God, God's doing all that, and he, and he will do all that. But yet you got a question, it seems. In verse number 14, but Zion said, Zion would be 
uh, that hill in Jerusalem where the temple was at, Mount Zion. Now, but but the word Zion is also used to uh, to be a name for all all of Israel, uh, all of God's people, all of the nation. It says, "But Zion said, the Lord hath forsaken me." Do you see that? The Lord hath forsaken me, and my Lord hath forgotten me. Isaiah has just showed them all that the Lord came to do for them, and 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 yet he says here, "But Zion says." Uh, God's forsaken me. God has forgotten us. He's forgotten me. It's a bitter question, isn't it? A bitter question arises in that question that, that, that many people still today uh, that, that are, are not even Israelites, uh, Gentiles even, but, but, uh, but many people even still today, and, and perhaps probably many of the Israelites, are asking the question, does, does God even care for his people. Does God care? The wonderful thing is chapter the rest of chapter 49 and going through Isaiah chapter 50. You know what these uh, set what this section of scripture does? It answers that question. It answers the question. It deals with the question. Does God care for his people? And these thoughts came to my mind as I been reading and studying, meditating on these things for uh, the last week or so, and, and even more so this afternoon. And, and there are three things that I think you can see here in these verses that we've read as a text, which was, which was simply verse 14, verse 15, and verse 16. But primarily in verses 15 and 16, you got the question, does God care for his people in verse 14? Let's look at the answer. Be good to have the answer to that, wouldn't it? Look in verse number, number uh, 15. Verse 15, uh, Isaiah is showing us, and God is saying this through his prophet Isaiah, and that is that God will never deny his people. God will never deny his people. Notice how he said it. Can a woman forget her sucking child that she should not have compassion on the son of her womb? Yea, they may forget Yet will I not forget thee. You know, we think it's an awful thing if, when a mother forgets a child or does harm, you know, to a child. It's, it's, it's unusual. Really, it really, it's something that is, 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 is unheard of, unimaginable. Uh, and, and so God is using this to make a point. And, uh, and we know that Israel is God's chosen people. And we know that God, God will never forget them. And so it's like he's saying here that, that even if a mother could forget her nursing child, he says, I will not forget you. He said that the, the mother might forget. Uh, there, there'll be parents and, and, and all. They, 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 they might forget. They might turn away from their child. And as we said, we, we see that happening. It, it does happen. It's really a horrible and unimaginable thing. I think it's a demonic thing myself. But, but we see it happening. And so God is using this to say that, you know, this is an extremely unusual thing that a woman forget her sucking child, her nursing child. Uh, that, that's, that's something that, that, that really is, is unthinkable. And so he's saying here, uh, yea, they may forget. A mother just might do that. But he says, I won't do it. He says, I will not forget my people. That's how great God's affection and desire for his people is. And this is for Israel, of course. But I believe it's for you and it's for me. It's for us today. It's relative today. Because you see, my friend, if you have trusted Jesus Christ as your own Savior, you mark it down. In fact, I'd like to say, I guarantee it. If you've trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior, you've truly been born again, listen, God will never forget you. You might feel like you let down in this world. You might be facing some troubles of this world, and this, this world might be out to get you, and maybe doubts arise. Maybe the devil throws those darts into your mind, and you begin to question things. You, like the Israelites here, seems like God's forsaken me. Seems like God has, has forgotten me. No, my friend, God will never forget his people. 
And he'll never deny his children. He will not forget you. In fact, the writer of the psalm in Psalm 27 verse 10 said this, When my father and my mother forsake me, then the Lord will take me up. Father and mother might do it, but the Lord won't do it. 2 Timothy chapter 4, we have the testimony of the Apostle Paul. In 2 Timothy chapter 4 and uh, verse number 16, 17 and 18, Paul the Apostle in the time of his imprisonment in Rome, and he said, he said this in verse 16, writing to Timothy, talking about being in the prison there. He says, at my first answer, no man stood with me, but all men forsook me. I pray God that it may not be laid to their charge. Notwithstanding, the Lord stood with me. He said, everybody else has turned tail and run. Everybody else has, has left me. He says, but not the Lord. He says, the Lord stood with me and strengthened me that by me the preaching might be fully known and that all the Gentiles might hear and I was delivered out of the mouth of, of, of the lion and the Lord shall deliver me from every evil work and will preserve me unto his heavenly kingdom to whom be glory forever and ever. Uh, amen. Paul says that, you know, he just says here that, that others left me but not the Lord. And that's his promise to you and to me. It's like his promise to Joshua. Back over in Joshua chapter number one. Verse 1, now after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spake unto Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' minister, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore arise, go over this Jordan, thou and all this people unto the land, which I do give to them, even to the children of Israel. Every place that the sole of your foot shall tread upon, that have I given unto you, as I said unto Moses, from the wilderness, from the wilderness and this Lebanon, even unto the great river, the river Euphrates, and all the land of the Hittites, and unto the great sea, toward the going down of the sun, shall be your coast. Listen, there shall no man be able to stand before thee, all the days of thy life, as I was with Moses, so I will be with thee. I will, listen, I will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. Amen. He says, I'm going to be with you, Joshua. He says, I'm going to be with you, with you all the way through it. Hebrews chapter 13. Hebrews chapter 13, verse number 5. This, this is for us. Let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as you have. Listen, for he hath said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee so that we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper, helper and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. He'll never leave you, he'll never forsake you. Jesus says, tells us in the Great Commission, Matthew chapter 28, verse number 20, and lo, I'm with you always, even until the end of the world. God does not forget his children and he will not deny his people. And the question comes up and, and someone says, well, God's forsaken me. And, oh, no. God does not deny his people. Number two, God will always defend his people. He will never deny his people, but he will always defend his people. In verse number uh, 16, Behold, I have graven thee upon the palms of my hands. And, and look, watch this now. Thy walls are continually before me. Thy walls are continually before me. God chose Jerusalem to be his holy city. It is called the city of God. It's called God's city. It's the holy city, Jerusalem. God chose it. God placed it there. And, 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 and though the enemies are trying to destroy it, trying to steal it, trying to take it away, trying to drive God's people out of it. It's not going to happen, my friend, because it's not, it's not their city. It, it, listen, it's, 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 not the, it's not the Palestinian city. It, it's, 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 not the, it's, it's not the Muslim city. It is God's city, amen. And he's going to keep it. God chose Jerusalem to be his holy city, and his holy city is surrounded by walls. And the walls symbolize God's eternal protection for his people. You remember David in Psalm 51, we, we refer to it as his great psalm of repentance following his sin with Bathsheba. I know you know that account and that story when he's calling upon God to have mercy upon him and, and, and then to blot out my transgressions in verse one, wash me through from my iniquity, cleanse me from my sin. He acknowledges his transgression, acknowledges his sin, he confesses his sin. It's a great psalm of repentance. And, and, and it's a good psalm for us to know 
In fact, it ought to be a prayer of, of ourselves every day of our lives. Verse number 10 in Psalm 51, uh, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation, and uphold me uh, with thy free spirit. And, and, and then, but drop down, if you happen to have found that, you're looking at Psalm 51, here's what I want you to see. David talks about the sacrifices, and he says the sacrifice, in verse 17, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and, and a contrite heart, O oh God, thou wilt not despise. That's what God was looking for in David's life. It's what God looks for in our lives as well. But here's what I want you to see is verse number 18. In this psalm of repentance, David crying out to the Lord, Lord, help me, forgive me, cleanse me, wash me. I know I've sinned. I know I've done wrong. Da David, David is getting right with God. And, and this is a heartfelt cry. I, I think this is why God would say, he's a man after my own heart. He says, it's like God says, David's heart, even though he, even though he failed, even though he sinned, he, he's, he's got that human nature like all of us. But he says, but his heart is, is directed to me. And he recognized it here with this psalm. And so what does David say? What does David desire? Verse number 18. Do good in thy good pleasure unto Zion. Notice this. Build thou the walls of Jerusalem. Build thou the walls of Jerusalem. David's recognizing here that Israel's, Israel's protection is in the Lord. That Israel's walls of protection are the walls that the Lord would build for them. And he cries out to the Lord, build thou the walls of Jerusalem. God will defend his people. He has and he'll continue to do so. Jeremiah chapter 29. Jeremiah 29 verse number 10. This having to do with uh, the prophecy concerning that Babylonian captivity and the coming out of it. And Jeremiah 29 verse 10, For thus saith the Lord, that after 70 years be accomplished at Babylon, I will visit you and perform my good work toward you in causing you to return to this place. And then verse number 11, uh, which is getting to be a, a popular verse of scripture for people to be quoting and all today. And, and, uh, and I'm afraid a lot of them are, are really not understanding uh, how they need to apply it. But they said, For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, said the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. Now, 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 now the, the primary application of this, you must understand, has to do with Israel. And it has to do with Israel's uh, deliverance from their captivity in Babylon. And God is saying to them, I, I, I know what I'm thinking for you. And what I'm thinking for you is I've got an expected end for you. I'm not done with you. I'm not leaving you. I'm not throwing you to the, to the lions. I'm not giving you away. But, but he says, I'm keeping you and I'm going to protect you. And God will never deny his people. And God will always defend his people. Always will. And he said that expected end. I believe that's looking ahead as we we're talking about to the end of the tribulation period when he brings that remnant of Israel back in and all Israel will be saved as the Apostle Paul writes. I think that's, the, God says, that, that, that's, what, that's what we're working towards. That's what we're headed to, to that expected end. And he says at that time, then shall you call upon me and you shall go and pray unto me and I will hearken unto you you shall seek me and find me when you shall search for me with all your heart. And I will be found of you, saith the Lord. And I will turn away your captivity and I will gather you from all the nations and from all the places whither I have driven you, saith the Lord. I will bring you again into the place uh, whence I caused you to be carried away captive. God says, that's the end I've got for you, my people. He says, I'm, gonna br I'm bringing you back. God will never deny his people. In Isaiah, in our text, the question has come up, does God really care that Zion says, the Lord hath forsaken me, and my Lord hath forgotten me. God says, can a woman forget her suck sucking child? He says, he, says, he says, she might, but I'm not going to forget you. He, he will never deny his people. And, and God says, thy walls are continually before me. He will always defend his people. And so let's get back to the question. 
And then let me try to answer it real quick, real easy for you. Does God care? Does he care for his people? Does he care for us? Does he care for you? Does he care for me? The answer is in that, in that A part, that beginning part of verse number 16. And the answer is simply this. Yes, he cares. Yes, he cares. Look at verse 16. Behold, I have graven thee upon the palms of my hands. That's what God says about his people. I believe, he, I believe this, this, this statement is not just for Israel alone, but it is for his people today, the church. It is for his people today, the saved by grace, bought by the blood, born again by the Spirit of God. It is for you and it is for me if you've trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior. Behold, I have graven thee upon the palms of my hand. I, I read something and, uh, and, and uh, that, that was new to me, actually, but understand that in the time uh, of, uh, that it perhaps started around the, this time of the Babylonian captivity and so forth in Israel, that the people of Israel, while they were in, in bondage, they, they began a thing of, of making markings on, their, on the palms of their hands of, of, of the temple, uh, of the city of Jerusalem. And, and it was to always remind them in the captivity that, that, that Babylon was not their home. They could just look and they could say, there's my home. Jerusalem's my home. God's house is my home. And, and, and so that, that that could be as what this could apply to. But this is, understand, this is not the captives in Babylon. This is God that is saying this. God says to his people, Behold, I have graven thee. I have graven you upon the palms of my hands. I think what we need to see is this. That the answer to the question, does God care, is yes, he cares. Oh, yes, he cares. God cares so much for his people, uh, including not just Israel, but you and me, that are saved by grace. God cares so much for his people that he says he actually sets them. That's you and me. He sets us. He sets them. He sets us. For a mark on his hand. That's what he's saying. And he's done that for us. He has. His love, his care, his saving grace. Understand uh, tonight, dear friend, all of this is forever marked in his hands, in the palms of his hands. Paul said it like this in Romans chapter 5, verse 8. But God commendeth his love towards us. And even while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. You remember after Jesus went to the cross, after he died, he was buried, and he rose again, and he had appeared to his disciples one Sunday evening, and, and, but one of his disciples, Thomas, was not there. And when the others had told him, said, we've seen the Lord. He's risen. He's alive. We've seen him. We talked to him. You remember Thomas said, well, I hadn't seen him yet. And, and he says, if, if I don't see him, and Thomas actually said, and said if, 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 I, if I don't see the nail prints in his hands, if I can't take my hand and put it into the wound in his side, he says, I, I, basically he said, I'm not going to believe it until I see it. I'm not going to believe your witness, your testimony, what you're saying. He said, I'm not going to believe it until I say it. Well, the next week is the next Sunday evening. They were gathered together in that room, and Thomas was there. And, um, and then Jesus uh, uh, appeared. It was after eight days. It was the following week. And, and uh, verse 26 of John chapter number 20. Uh, again, his disciples were with them, and Thomas with them. Then came Jesus the doors being shut and stood in the midst and said, Peace be unto you. 
Then saith he to Thomas, Reach hither thy finger, behold my hands. Reach hither thy hand, thrust it into my side. Be not faithless, but believe him. And Thomas answered and said unto him, My Lord and my God. And Jesus said unto him, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. I believe with all of my heart that when Jesus said those words, his very thoughts was towards people like you and me. We've not seen what those disciples saw. We, we didn't see the miracles that he did. We, we, we didn't, uh, we, we didn't uh, sit with him at the, at, at the supper, the, the Passover meal. We weren't there in the garden when, they, when the soldiers came and arrested him. We weren't there in that upper room when he appeared before us. And we knew that he was alive after his passion, after his death on the cross. No, no, we, we were not there then. But yet, because God has given us his word, and he's given, he's given his spirit, he sent his spirit into the world. Because God's given us of his word and of his, uh, of his convicting power of his Holy Spirit. You and I have had, can have the opportunity and have had the opportunity to trust Jesus Christ as our own personal Savior and to, and to be able to say, I believe. I believe. Amen. Jesus told Thomas, Lord, he told Thomas, Thomas, because you've seen, you believe. But I believe he's saying even more blessed are those down the road that have not seen, but they've believed. Now here's the thing. When he told him to look at my hands, look at my hands. I think our text in Isaiah 49 should say to us that Jesus was saying to Thomas, look at my hands. I've got you stamped right there. And I think that through faith in Jesus Christ, when he comes for us, whether it's by the grave or whether it's by, uh, by the, the, the rapture and the change and our, giving our new bodies, when he comes for us and when we're in his presence and we're in heaven, I mean, for that matter, if you... Uh, die before the rapture and immediately your soul and your spirit is with the Lord the Bible says I don't know how what that's going to be like what just the spirit and the soul without the body is like I just believe my Bible that says that says I'm going to be with Jesus and my soul and my spirit I believe I'll be able to see him I believe I'll be able to hear his voice even though I won't have that, that, that body. I don't know what kind of body or what kind of form or what, what it is that we're going to have at that time until the resurrection. Uh, but uh, I, know I, I know we'll be with him. And I believe we'll be able to see him. And, and we've said it before and you realize and understand. All that God has prepared for us in heaven. Jesus tells us in John 14, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in, in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. The word I saw have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And all that's been prepared for us in heaven. Paul the apostle said, I have not seen nor ear heard, neither has entered into the, into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them that love him. What he has prepared for us. What he has for us. Oh, we, we like to try to imagine. And the closest thing we can get to it is the old hymn that says how beautiful heaven must be. Uh, that's just, I think that's the closest we can get. But in heaven, there's going to be all that God has prepared for us. Not made with hands. The Bible tells us it's, it, it, it's, not, it's not going to be made with hands. With man's hands. Everything was, would be made by God. Man would have, would have had nothing to do with what we 
will be able to see and experience in, in heaven. But there'll be one thing that you and I will, will see with our own eyes in heaven that was made by men. And that's his scars. His, his, his marks in the, in the palm of his hands. Now, whether you understand in the palm or in the wrist, you know, you know I, I, that, that, that kind of, not really a debate. It really, it really doesn't, it doesn't affect things one way or the other. But Isaiah said God puts a mark in the palms of his hands. I kind of think that's a, maybe a better way to picture it. In the palms of his hands. I'm not going to argue with you if you believe it's in his wrist. In the crucifixion. I just know Isaiah said uh, God's got a mark in the palms of his hands. He, he has placed, uh, Isaiah said he placed, he placed you, he placed me. He said, I've graven thee upon the palms of my hands. And so there's going to be a mark there. But I believe it's that mark that was made by man. The mark of the spikes of the crucifixion. And it'll always be there. It'll be there forever. When it comes to the time of his kingdom on the earth and we're present with him in the millennial time and Jesus speaks to his people. He speaks to us as our king and ruling the earth. And at times I would suspect he, he would even, and in, in fact, I anticipate he will. I look forward to it. I hope he does. I believe he will. When he'll raise his arms to give us a blessing, they're going to be there. They're always going to be there. It's never going to change. It's never going to be taken away. So you ask the question, does Jesus care? My friend, look at his hands. Look at his hands. Believe the Bible. And by faith, look at his hands. And you'll know the answer to the question. He does care more than anyone ever has or could. Amen? Amen. Let's go ahead and stand together, our heads bowed, our eyes closed for prayer. Lord, thank you so much for the word of God this evening. An opportunity to study once again in this wonderful book of the prophet Isaiah. And Lord, it's, it's just, uh, you know how it's been just amazing to my own heart as I just go week by week and, and look at these verses and the one uh, and, and the verses following the other verses the sections following other sections chapter by chapter and so much that, 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 is, that, that we can see of you of your power uh, of your truth of your love of your mercy of your grace and even at times of your judgment but Lord, so much that we see of you in this, in this marvelous book. And Lord, tonight, we, can, we even see your hands. We even see your hands. And you've put that mark there. It's for eternity. And it is for us. And it is for all who believe the gospel and trust you, Lord Jesus, as their own Savior. And Lord, we pray for someone that would hear this message at some point that will come to that place of believing and seeing by faith and trusting and receiving your amazing gift of love and grace and mercy and salvation. And Lord, we'll trust you and thank you for that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. We'll sing together as Brother Tim leads us. Page 271.